Good morning, everyone. The first item of business today is general questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would be grateful if we could have succinct questions and answers, please. Um, question one, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the final report of the Scottish Islands Renewable Project. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, the Scottish Government welcomes the Independent Scottish Islands Renewables report, a Project report published by the Scottish and UK Governments on the 15th of May. It confirms what many of us in Scotland already know, that the renewable energy resources of the Western Isles, the Orkney Islands and the Shetland Isles are significant and can make a cost-effective contribution to 2020 renewables and decarbonisation targets. With the right policy and regulatory approach, the islands can help ensure security of supply and supply diversification and provide up to 5% of total GB electricity demand by 2030. And there are significant socio-economic benefits from developing island renewables. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for that answer. Uh, does he consider that the Northern and Western Isles have the best of all opportunities for marine and wind energy, and that if they're not connected to the mainland, they'd be prevented from the chance to fulfil this potential, and were that to happen through lack of support from the UK government, would that government, in a very literal sense, be cutting off those islands and their residents from these massive opportunities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, Mr McKenzie is, is absolutely right about the scale of the opportunity that exists to capture the natural energy potential that's, that, uh, is, uh, uh, that, that, that is in and surrounding the uh, Western Isles, the Orkney Islands and the Shetland Isles. There is the potential by 2030 to create up to 3,500 jobs in the Western Isles, almost 2,900 in the Shetland Islands and over 4,500 in the Orkney Islands. Um, it is essential that um, the necessary steps are taken through the electricity market reform process into which the Scottish Government has made constructive suggestions about an island's uplift on the contract for difference proposals that will be considered um, as part of this exercise. And we are working closely with the United Kingdom government to reach agreement which may create the opportunities to realise this abundant energy potential in our northern and western islands. Many thanks. Liam McArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, in terms of the work that's been done with the, the, uh, the UK Government following on from the excellent report from the, uh, the Working Group, that one idea worth prosecuting is looking at the Crown Estate, underwriting some of the uh, risk and the cost of putting in place the, the, the cable infrastructure that's needed, not just um, to support renewables in Orkney, but in the Western Isles and Shetland, as uh, Mike McKenzie indicated. Cabinet Secretary. I think the, the point that Mr MacArthur raises is, is, is a fair point and um, a, a, an issue which, of course, um, can be pursued. The Crown Estate, as Mr MacArthur will know, is, uh, is, is not accountable to the Scottish Parliament. It's a, it operates on a reserve basis. Um, but I'm quite certain that the issue that uh, he has raised is one that should be uh, examined and explored as part of the constructive discussions we are having to try to resolve uh, these issues. Um, clearly there is a, a financial gap here and um, if there are ways in which we can close that financial gap either through the, um, the suggestions that we've made about the island's uplift and the contract for difference or by the suggestion Mr MacArthur has made or by a combination of the two then I think that will be welcomed by all of the individuals that uh, Mr MacArthur represents and certainly will be welcomed by the Scottish Government as an indication of how we can take forward um, investment proposals to realise and harness our en renewable energy potential. Many thanks. Question two, Chick Brody. Chick Brody does not appear to be here. We'll be seeking an explanation by the end of the day from Mr Brody. Question three, Colin Keir. To ask the Scottish Government what the implications are for the ambition set out in Scotland's Digital Future, a strategy for Scotland of the UK Government's Super Connected Cities Initiative, funding for Edinburgh not meeting state aid rules. Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. The Scottish Government is extremely disappointed that the UK Government has been unable to secure state aid clearance for key aspects of its Super Connected Cities scheme. As a result of this failure, projects in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Perth will no longer be able to deliver ultra-fast broadband access 
through this scheme, uh, and that could, of course, make the achievement of our national infrastructure ambitions all the more challenging. However, we are collaborating with Scotland's cities on a range of digital initiatives through the Scottish Cities Alliance. A key part of this work will be to ensure that any future funding for broadband in cities is planned properly from the outset in conjunction with the European Commission to ensure full state aid compliance. Thank you. Colin Keir. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that though the Super Connected Cities initiative is well intended, it has seen a huge waste of public funds due to the apparent lack of awareness of state aid rules by the Westminster Government, which has resulted in constituents of mine in, in rural West Edinburgh, such as Kirkliston, not having the broadband connection speeds and infrastructure they were promised and deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, firstly, I agree with the member that the uh, super-connected uh, cities uh, scheme was undoubtedly um, well-intentioned, uh, but I do agree that there appears to have been a lack of foresight and a lack of planning on the part of the UK government in relation to ensuring that the scheme uh, was state-aid compliant. And the last-minute redesign of the programme has placed enormous pressure on Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Perth, who at very short notice have had to refocus their plans around city Wi-Fi and voucher schemes for SMEs. We've supported and will continue to support City of Edinburgh Council through this process and we remain hopeful that the redesigned proposals will still deliver benefits for the city. Um, however, the lack of infrastructure uh, remains disappointing. I should say that West Edinburgh remains within our own step change uh, programme uh, and that should help us enhance broadband speeds in the area. Looking forward, as I said in my original answer, uh, we're working with the Cities Alliance on a project to map digital infrastructure across Scotland and that will give us a basis to plan future investment, which we will ensure is done in a state aid compliant way. Many thanks. Question four, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in conjunction with local authorities to tackle scamming. Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill. Uh, we are firmly committed to tackling the problem of scamming, which is often targeted at the most vulnerable members of our society. Uh, we believe everyone has the right to feel safe in their community, and it's unacceptable for people to feel intimidated on their own doorstep or they're in their own home, as is invariably the case with this type of crime. The Scottish Government and the Scottish Business Resilience Centre are currently working on a project chaired by Chief Inspector Ronnie McGauchan of Police Scotland. This project will engage all 32 local authorities across Scotland to ensure consistency of practice, maximum protection for adults at risk of financial harm and greater collaborative efforts of all key stakeholders in the public and private sectors. The project will build on the wealth of good work that's already underway across Scotland. We do all need to continue to work together to prevent them and to protect the vulnerable. Day. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer and draw his attention to an initiative being launched by Angus Council tomorrow. SNP-led Angus Council is in launching Scam Free Angus, I believe the first local authority to adopt a specific policy on financial harm, one which involves cross-departmental and multi-agency cooperation and is aimed particularly at protecting the most vulnerable of adults. I wonder whether the Cab Sec would join me in welcoming this initiative and encourage other councils to do something similar. Yeah, I do join with the member, and I am aware, not simply as Justice Secretary, but indeed as a constituency member of the harm and trauma caused, especially to the vulnerable by those often sophisticated uh, scams that are carried out. So the excellent work being done by Angus Council is one that we fully support. It is important that we take on board the important role that trading standards and local authorities provide. We are working with COSLA and I do think that this is something that hopefully will be integrated. I have been involved in matters there and indeed I pay tribute to outgoing um, Assistant Chief Constable Angela Wilson who raised particular matters relating to the sophisticated scams that as an administration we took on board, not simply with Police Scotland, but also with some financial institutions who, along with trading standards and local authorities, have an important role. These are sophisticated matters. They're predicated in the vulnerable. They're deeply hurtful. And we all have a duty to protect those members. So I'm grateful to the member for raising this and indeed to his council colleagues for their actions. Many thanks. Qu question five. And the name of Ken McIntosh has not been lodged, but an explanation has been provided. Question six. Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to promote the uptake of the open market shared equity scheme in rural areas. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has procured the services of five registered social landlords who administer the open market shared equity scheme throughout Scotland. 
The scheme is being promoted to all first-time buyers through local authorities, advice agencies, local financial advisors and estate agents. Some registered social landlords are also planning national newspaper advertising in the summer, with other media advertising planned for the autumn. Alex Ferguson. Well, I'm grateful for that response, but I'm sorry to say that the scheme simply doesn't appear to be working, at least not in my constituency. Is the Minister aware that since 2009 there have been just 79 shared equity purchases in Dumfries and Galloway, of which 62 have been in Dumfries Town itself? Only five have been in Galloway, and only two out of the 79 have been in communities of less than 8,000 people. And I wonder if she would agree with me that there is not enough flexibility in establishing the scheme's threshold prices, that the scheme is not being promoted enough throughout my region at least, and it just isn't working as it should. So could I ask the Minister to look at what improvements might be made to this scheme to ensure that my rural constituents are given an equal opportunity to get a foot on the housing ladder? Minister. Okay, we certainly um, are aware of the challenges associated uh, with delivering affordable housing in rural um, areas and uh, island communities, where I'm mu very much aware that small numbers can make a difference. But there have been a number of other government initiatives for, specifically for the rural areas, and we continue to look at that. And certainly, I'm more than willing to discuss the open market shared equity scheme, but we do think the 10% uplift in the threshold has taken account of the rural areas, uh, but I'm more than willing to discuss that in more detail with the member. Many thanks. Uh, question seven, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to exploit the potential of Scotland's shale gas reserves. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, proposals for coal bed methane or shale gas production in Scotland will be studied on their merits. Each proposal will be considered through the normal planning process and the appropriate regulatory regimes, including SEPA's guidance on the regulation of shale gas and coal bed methane, published in December 2012. The Scottish Government will continue to support Scottish companies in the oil and gas supply chain to utilise their world-leading skills, knowledge and expertise in the development of opportunities presented across Europe and wider afield. Martin Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, response. This week's report from America's Energy Information Administration states that the UK's technically recoverable shale gas reserves are 26 trillion cubic feet, 10 times our annual gas demand, and a reasonable chunk of that is in Scotland. The Institute of Directors previously estimated that 35,000 jobs could be created from this new industry. Given that in the US, shale gas has delivered a 50% cut in wholesale energy costs, a reindustrialization of the economy, and a cut of millions of tonnes in carbon emissions, will the Scottish Government be enthusiastic about pursuing this new opportunity? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as, as, as Mr Fraser well knows, the Scottish Government takes forward an approach which is designed to uh, support and to maximise sustainable investment in our economy and that will be the approach that we continue to take. In relation to the uh, development of shale gas reserves, these, um, as I indicated in my earlier answer, um, individual applications will be studied on their merits. Um, they will be considered through the due process that uh, the existing arrangements within Scotland uh, provide and the government will give, uh, and its regulatory authorities will give due consideration to um, any um, approaches that are made in this respect. Um, clearly, it is essential in all of this debate to rely on substantive and quality information about the availability of resources and also about the, um, the, the, the manner and the practicalities of uh, the exploitation of these resources, and that will be an implicit part of the assessment that is made of each individual application in its consideration on its merits. Many thanks. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Following an outcry in the Moody'sburn area of my constituency about potential shale gas exploitation, can the Cabinet Secretary guarantee that the views of communities will be fully considered and taken into account with proper consultation processes before decisions are taken um, around granting permissions for such controversial gas extraction schemes? In my response to Mr Fraser, um, I emphasised clearly the importance of uh, due process to be undertaken to ensure that these applications are properly considered because I recognise the issues and concerns that Elaine Smith raises on behalf of her constituents. 
Uh, there are two particular areas of scrutiny that would be applied to any application within Scotland. One would be in relation to the local authority. One would be in relation to SEPA. There is, of course, a separate licensing process that is uh, presided over by uh, the Department for Energy and Climate Change within the United Kingdom Government. In both of these processes, both by SEPA and the local authority, um, there will be um, clear expectations about the level of consultation that would be required to be undertaken with communities to ensure that the concerns that Elaine Smith raises would be properly and fully considered as part of the process. And I would certainly want to be confident that all authorities would take forward that approach consistent with their existing responsibilities and obligations. Many thanks. Question 8, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Scottish greenhouse gas inventory will show that the emission target for 2011 has been reached and whether the shortfall resulting from the missed target in 2010 has been compensated for. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, official statistics on emissions of greenhouse gases in Scotland were published on June, uh, 7th of June 2013. Unadjusted figures uh, show that Scotland's direct emissions fell by 9.9% between 2010 and 2011. However, once the effect of emissions trading is factored in, uh, the net Scottish emissions account only fell by 2.9%. The result is uh, that Scotland's statutory climate change target for 2011 has been missed by 0.848 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. Annual fluctuations in emissions are to be expected. Scotland's long-term trend is in the right direction, down by more than a quarter since 1990. When the targets were originally set, they envisaged a 23.9% reduction in 2011 after adjusting for emissions trading. Uh, we have actually achieved a 25.7% reduction. Comparing like for like, we have cut emissions more than any country in the EU15. Uh, Scottish Ministers plan to publish the finalised second climate change report on proposals and policies, or RPP2, on 27th of June. This report will show how we can compensate for the excess emissions in 2010 and 2011 over the longer term. Patrick Harvey. So the short answer being no and no. Does the, does the Minister not accept that it, this news justifies the view expressed by many that ambitious climate change targets can only be achieved with a radical change of policy? Or does he imagine that the Scottish Government can carry on building every road, expanding every airport, and even burning Mr Fraser's 26 trillion cubic, litres, uh, cubic feet of uh, shale gas, and that climate change emission cuts will happen by wishing for it? Minister. Um, well, clearly, I, I'm not sure if, if Mr Fraser actually owns those 26 uh, million <laughs> cubic litres of shale gas, but um, I'm sure he'd... He, he can respond to that point himself, um, but the serious point is uh, that we recognise the, 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 the severity of the challenge that we face globally, but also within Scotland to achieve what are, as I said on, on record the other day, still the world's most leading uh, cl climate change targets, and we still have world leading ambition. Uh, we recognise that we have to deliver the RPP2 document in draft form, which will be finalised later this month will show, as I said in my answer, to pick up the point about the no and no, that we can recoup the, the lost ground over the longer term. So we can address the issue in terms of the overshoot in terms of emissions. It's worth Mr, Mr. Harvey recognising, I think I made this point to him earlier on uh, this week, that we face a situation where the baseline has moved by about 2.5 megatons in 1990, and yet we missed the target this year by 0.848 megatons. So we have had a faster rate of descent, as I said in my answer, uh, than had been envisaged in terms of percentage reduction by 2011. Yes, we have to Please do thanks. more. This government is committed to doing more. And that's, we'll do our best excellent. to demonstrate that. In Thank you. Question 9, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact Ministry of Defence rules for procurement of naval vessels will have on jobs in Scotland. And it's Secretary Nicola Sturgeon. The objective of the MOD's rules, as I understand it, is to incentivise cost efficiency in order to help boost exports. As Bill Kidd will be aware, the shipbuilding workforce on the Clyde is highly efficient and indeed renowned for the quality of its work. I would therefore expect that it would be uh, very well placed to benefit from any environment uh, that uh, enhances uh, and puts an emphasis on these particular qualities. 
Thank you. Brief supplementary from Mr Kidd, please. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Can I suggest further that the MOD presently procures equipment from overseas, including from France, where Thales, a company with a significant presence in Glasgow as a major supplier to the British Navy, that it is only a fear factor that is being thrown into the equation in order to suggest that leading companies and highly skilled workers here in Scotland would be barred from bidding for and receiving orders from the MOD following independence? Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree with that. I, uh, as members will be aware, used to represent in this Parliament govern shipyard. I know that the skill and the efficiency of the workforce in there will equip that shipyard to compete uh, exactly. and to compete successfully regardless uh, of the constitutional uh, arrangements. The MOD uh, has, I think, recently uh, placed an order in Korea. So anybody who suggests that our own shipyards wouldn't succeed in the future, uh, I do think, uh, is, as the member uh, suggests, uh, not being entirely credible in the situation. Many thanks.